Okay, so we are live. And hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's stream. Uh, my name is Sayyam Bhattak, uh, and I'm working as Director of Technical Evangelism at SIVO. And this is my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash Sayyam911, which you can uh, subscribe. Uh, today, we'll be talking about Graal VM. And I have with me a very special guest uh, who is Graal VM project lead and uh, working at Oracle Labs. So he's the founder. Uh, uh, of Graal VM and working as a project lead. Uh, so uh, Thomas, welcome uh, to the stream and uh, thank you for uh, having uh, giving us time uh, to uh, explain all about Graal VM. Uh, and today's uh, today's discussion will be all about Graal VM and uh, we'll make sure that I and the community learn something new and uh, we get so I want to introduce yourself a bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Yes, I'm Thomas. I'm uh, I'm Kravium, uh, uh, project lead. And uh, yeah, so I was, I, I'm really into compilers and programming languages uh, since the very beginning. It's like uh, my passion. And uh, this uh, Kravium project is kind of a, a result uh, of, of that, that passion. And uh, yeah, so, so thanks, thanks for having this conversation as I am. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, like, uh, I guess, like uh, we talked initially a little bit about how the Gravium project got started, or um... yeah. Uh, so first would be um, like we have a okay, we have few folks as well who has joined. Hello, everyone. Um, so yes, let's start with first the history of of Graal VM, like how this project all all came along. And then we'll get going into what it actually is, then the demos and the use cases and all that parts. But what from where it originated and what what were the initial thoughts and how you people, uh, you or the team or the thoughts, how the thought process came in and how you people thought of building something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the, the very original parts of Gravium were actually coming out of a project that's called Maxine Research VM which was a research project at Sun Labs about, uh, I think it's now almost 20 or 15 to 20 years ago, uh, where uh, the idea of the research project to build was to build a, a virtual machine for Java in Java. And uh, this was this was a project uh, led by Bernd Matiske, and uh, he uh, was hiring me as one of his interns at some point. So I was, I was doing an internship uh, in the Maxine research project and this is how how the the, the, the initial parts of Kravium or the ideas behind it got, got started. Uh, because this is when we were starting to build a just-in-time compiler for Java, written in Java. And um, I was back then uh, using the C1 just-in-time compiler, which is the one, uh, the client compiler in the Hotspot virtual machine, uh, which is written in C++. And uh, I was using that as a, as the source, and I was translating this C++ compiler to Java. Because we always thought, well, you know, why are all these uh, virtual machines and compilers written in C++? It's like, you have very much more productive uh, programming languages nowadays, and, and Java is, is certainly one of the most productive ones out there. And uh, we really wanted to, um, to push the envelope in terms of what you could write in Java. And the original, like you, even nowadays in, in Gravium, in the Gravium cheat compiler source code, uh, a lot of the Java code is, um, is still, you can still see the similarities in terms of concepts, methods, and, and the structure to the C1 uh, client compiler of Hotspot. So, so that was like the very, very beginning, right? But so Maxine, uh, and, and then later, like uh, at the Maxine Research VM, like uh, I did two internships and then and then Oracle was taking over uh, some microsystems. And um, initially we thought, yeah, you know, that, that could maybe be bad for, for the research project, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, thankfully, it was kind of the opposite. So Oracle was actually uh, really investing much more into our project um, than, than we thought. And, and this was then when Oracle took over Sun was when the Gravium project really got the, the a major traction, but we we then like there like changed the focus a little bit because we were like in the Maxine research project you you gotta like uh, write a whole VM and everything in Java, 
And then we thought, okay, why, why don't we just concentrate on the JIT compiler, uh, which is a smaller piece. And, uh, and let's reuse the vast you know, engineering uh, like, um, that, that went into the hotspot runtime system and everything. And let's just reuse the hotspot runtime system and put just the, the JIT compiler uh, into hotspot. Uh, so this was a little bit of a refocusing of the project that we went with a little bit more realistic goals uh, initially to get to get something working, right? And and that's when we were like um, putting then the C1, this C1 compiler that we were translating from C++ to Java, we, we, we used to call C1X. And then when we were putting it back into hotspot, we were, we were uh, calling it C1X for hotspot. And uh, then like, um, but then like uh, one of our like uh, uh, managers, like, like, you know, uh, Mario, like Volsko came to us and said like, look, you know, this, this is a strange name, right? And C1X from Hotspot really is not a, like, this is, this is for, I don't know, maybe the SMS culture of, you know, a lot of abbreviations is kind of, you know, but, but like, uh, it was like, you know, you, you gotta change the name here, right? And, and thankfully he, he pushed us to change the name. Otherwise, we will be talking about the C1X for Hotspot VM at the moment, <laughs> and uh, and then we we renamed it to uh, to to GraalVM as as the combination of of the GraalVM JIT compiler with uh, with the Hotspot um, uh, virtual machine, and uh, yeah, so this was like this is kind of the, the originals of of how this project and project name and and the sort the, the project came about. So when was the first initial version of, of Graal VM released? Very initial, uh, maybe it was like a very initial public version, uh, maybe the alpha or some uh, version released. Yeah, so the, the like you could actually say that the, that the, uh, the Graal JIT compiler combined with Hotspot was the originals of the Graal VM. We didn't call it Graal VM back then, it was more the Graal project. Uh, and that was released, uh, I think it was in late 2012 already, uh, that you could start to experiment with that setup. Uh, problem back then was that, yeah, the, the JIT compiler didn't give so much performance. And also we had big startup problems because, well, the JIT compiler is written in Java, so uh, it has to compile itself before it can start to run faster. <laughs> So it's like a really slow start because the JIT compiler, while it's compiling itself, needs to be interpreted. And only after it compiles itself, it can start compiling itself faster and faster and faster, right? Uh, so this original version really was, I mean, it was like interesting from a research point of view, but from a practical point of view, it's like, it was almost unusable. And then only, only later on, like the, the first release of the Gravium open source project as, as, as a release that had some practical use. Uh, only came later in um, 2017, so it's it's really only uh, three and a half years uh, where we then like went out with the whole Gravium. And and there's one additional thing here, which is like initially we were like you know doing just the JIT compiler for Java, but then later on, because I did I did also in in like as one of my internships, I also did an internship at Google with the V8 team uh, where I was doing a work on the JavaScript uh, JIT compiler. Uh, so this was back then, this was Crankshaft. Nowadays it's a different one, but, but back then in Chrome was the Crankshaft uh, JIT compiler uh, that I was, uh, there was a small team, uh, including me developing that at Google. And so the, um, so I, I then like when I came back from this internship at Google and, uh, and, and, and saw basically how JavaScript JIT compilers are, are working, et cetera, I was thinking, you know, why are we always creating a new JIT compiler for like every language? So, so this seems a complete, you know, waste of waste of engineering because uh, the the JIT compilers between languages or the language runtimes more generally between languages have a lot of things in common, right? Common. And that's, as, as computer scientists, we typically try, you know, not to violate the don't repeat yourself principle. So you factor out everything into methods and you make sure everything is reused. And um, here it was, uh, I thought the same thing here, right? Why are we not reusing a lot of pieces of the runtime between different languages? And this brought then this idea of a very important aspect of the Graalvium project, which is to 
really support uh, many languages. So we have here this uh, little uh, graphic that we typically like to show here, uh, which just shows that, yeah, you know, there's many programming languages and there will be many programming languages moving forward because, you know, you want to you use different languages for different tasks. So it's like maybe sometimes I want to have something more dynamically typed, maybe sometimes something more statically typed. And, um, and then, like, we were building a layer on top of our JIT compiler that really enables this JIT compiler to be multilingual. Uh, we call this layer the truffle layer. So this was the, the truffle framework is the framework how we make GraalVM able to run uh, many different uh, languages. Uh, because I just thought, well, we don't really want to build like a new JIT compiler, a new runtime for every language. We want one that is reusable. And I think GraalVM is, is the first project that really at scale is able to, to support such a wide variety of languages. Uh, th there's many languages that, are, that would be on a certain, you know, that, that would target a certain bytecode set, for example. Uh, for example, the Java bytecode set or the, the Microsoft uh, Common Language Runtime bytecode set. But um, with CrawlVM, the languages have more flexibility how they express their semantics. So they don't need to fit into a specific bytecode set. And this enables us to, to have the languages be more natural uh, and and not have to uh, compromise on semantics or, or performance uh, for their own specialities. And, and this is where we like uh, with GraalVM then um, have like this really big set of languages that we can uh, run. Um, and this is on the one hand, of course, the GVM based languages that uh, many people are familiar with, Java, Scala, Kotlin, Groovy. Uh, but then we also have a set of dynamic languages that we have implementations for, uh, mainly Ruby, Python, R, and JavaScript. And we also then added uh, static languages to the mix, uh, where we are compiling them to LLVM bitcode and then have an LLVM bitcode execution on top of Gravium. So uh, these all are... Uh basically built out of the truffle layer so have, yes uh, that building blocks that acts as a interface or i mean uh, the connection between uh, running the same uh, reusing the same uh, graal framework for the other languages yes yes all of those are built on the truffle layer uh, okay. and 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 they are built with interoperability in mind and now it's actually since like up until two weeks ago, I actually had to say this a little bit differently because up until two weeks ago, the JVM based languages could not run on the Truffle layer. But with the latest Gravium release, uh, which is the 21.0, we now have also the ability to run all the JVM based languages on the Truffle layer. Um, and it, it then enables also all Truffle like agnostic tooling and uh, other like uh, like manageability benefits of the truffle layer to those languages. We have a WebAssembly as well. Uh, sometimes people are like, oh, you know, Gravi and WebAssembly is yeah, like competitors, or I don't know, it's like on, on Twitter, sometimes some, some people are, are posting uh, things of like, you know, this is a competitive product or something like this. Uh, that's, that's, I think, the wrong, wrong thinking because Gravi and WebAssembly, they are, different things that you cannot compare. It's like with GraalVM, you can execute WebAssembly, for example. Uh, so GraalVM is, the, is a runtime engine. WebAssembly is a, is a standard format, how to, how to express program semantics. And uh, we can actually also, uh, also take in WebAssembly and execute it. Which, which helps us to then uh, have WebAssembly, for example, compiled with other Gravium languages. Because WebAssembly typically is more for statically typed languages where you would compile C, C++ into WebAssembly or something like that. You wouldn't compile Python into WebAssembly, for example. And with Gravium, you could then like um, still have Python interact with WebAssembly via the interoperability that we, that we provide.
Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting, and I think uh, including WebAssembly has removed some of the uh, misconceptions or confusion around uh, the the both of Graal VM and WebAssembly comparison. Uh, so I mean, uh, so like we have the Graal VM layer, which is just in time compiler, and uh, the basic aim is to make program runs faster, more fast, and uh, uh, then we have used that Graal VM uh, framework uh, across multiple languages. So we have done the reusable thing as well using the Truffle framework. And we have a set of languages which are already supported as of now, as you all can see on the screen. Uh, so now if, if somebody comes in and uh, they, they already know a few of the languages and they are running it. They are developing the code on it. Now, how do we make them understand what Graal VM is and what benefits it would provide you? Yes. So, so there is there is. Um, um, I think uh, three benefits that Graalvm provides here. Uh, one is one here. One benefit is just the fast execution of of the of the runtime, and this benefit is is like for Java based languages, for example, we can just, we have a better JIT compiler, for example. So as the, as the program executes, it will uh, run with more requests per second. It will use less uh, CPU time for the same work if you run uh, Java programs on it. Uh, the same thing for Scala or Kotlin programs. Uh, actually, Krabim is specifically popular in the Scala community because Scala has more abstractions and uh, because of these additional abstractions, we can optimize the code better, and we can have a better, uh, better uh, advantage over over other JIT compilers. For the dynamic languages like Ruby, Python, R, uh, it's the same thing. Some of them are actually typically only interpreted, so there is really not a lot of peak performance in these languages because they're always interpreted. But we provide a JIT compiler for that. Uh, so we provide a JIT compiler for Ruby, JIT compiler for Python, etc. Right. So just running the languages faster is one thing. Right? Then we have uh, one specialty, which we can later talk about a little bit in more detail, uh, which is that for the JVM-based languages, you have this add of time compilation. And a lot, a lot of people in the in the JVM space are seeing this as the main thing behind Gravia because this is this is a game changer for JVM-based languages, uh, where like you can compile it ahead of time and make it much uh, faster in startup and smaller in memory footprint uh, because you no longer have the whole warm-up process that you would have if you would uh, do just-in-time compilation. So that's the number two benefit, but that benefit currently only applies to the languages on the GVM side. We are working at the moment on uh, some new features, uh, and I don't want to spoil anything, but in the upcoming Gravian releases, we will kind of get some of the startup benefits um, in terms of you know ahead of time compilation, also like beyond TVM based languages, uh, and uh, yeah, so so that that's just uh, we will soon have also this part so sort of to a larger part of the ecosystem. And currently, this is mainly for for Java TVM based languages, and uh, and the third benefit is 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 really the the language interoperability and and polyglot aspect of it. Right now, a lot of people say why would you combine two languages? Like, I don't want to combine two languages, right? And so there is, there is a few use scenarios where this can be interesting. Uh, one scenario is like, I want to program in Java, let's say, because I'm familiar with Java, etc. But I want to solve a problem for which a very nice Python module exists. There's a nice Python library uh, already out there. It solves my problem but I want to write the core part of my application in Java. Then Gravium provides an ability to do that uh, without actually creating another web service or another service where you do inter-process communication, uh, but you would really be able to just call out from your Java to that Python uh, library. So, and with Gravium now suddenly, uh, and this language ability, we can combine the strengths of all the language ecosystem into one. So you don't need to like, um, yeah, you don't you need to like search for a module in your own language. You can reuse a module from another language. That's one core use case that that uh, that has sometimes quite some value. Uh, the other use case is when your program itself is not just an application, but it's a platform that you want to make extensible. 
So um, let's say you make a web service, but your customers should be able to uh, change some of the logic here and there, right? It's a typical, you know, approach of, 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 of applications that are scriptable. So you have a core of your application and it's written in a core language, let's say Java here, but then you want to make it extensible and scriptable because you want your customers or users to be able to change the logic here and there. Now with CrawlVM, we allow you to like embed the other languages into your core platform. So you can then say like, look, I have this core logic here. And then I call out, I create a new context. We call this a context. Um, and we can create many different contexts within the same program. Uh, and this context can then run a different language. And it can provi provide, we also provide some security and sandboxing capabilities. So you can run untrusted or you can at least run less trusted code in these uh, sandboxes. Uh, so you, and the nice thing with CrowdVM here is like typically when you would use, let's say, the Rhino JavaScript engine to extend your Java app, you are fixed on JavaScript. But here with CrowdVM, you can create these context extensions in a language independent way. So then if some of our users are, you know, more familiar with Ruby because they like Ruby, they can then customize your app in Ruby or others can customize the app in Python and others in JavaScript. But from your perspective, you don't, as a platform owner that makes your platform customizable, you don't need to do a lot of work to support these additional languages. It's basically a few more lines of code. Because the whole language embedding box of CrawlVM is, is language agnostic. So you do it once and then like all the languages uh, are like capable of running within that language extension box. And there is, there's actually more, there's a lot of applications that want to be extensible. Um, uh, one of the core use cases that we have there uh, internally at Oracle is the NetSuite platform, which is um, Oracle's uh, software as a service uh, offering. And uh, it, is, it is one of the uh, platforms that are using CrawlVM to make it extensible to customers or, or other groups within Oracle. So uh, from what I am understanding on a very high level overview is, uh, so we have uh, a Graal VM and the core use case, I mean, the very good use case can be, uh, I can write a code uh, in the language that I'm comfortable with, but still I'll be able to use a very good feature which already exists or a very good module which already exists in some other language uh, and inside my code without writing a separate web service. So yes, we we are we now live in the world of microservices, nano services. Uh, so people can say, okay, we can simply write two services and they can connect with each other. Uh, but this one is integrated. So this one is still one single app and a single service and in that only you are able to call the uh, function or, or a complete module or use that module of from the other language uh, now like the python has a very strong hold in, in machine learning uh, space so we can use some of the machine learning uh, modules which are uh, good over there inside uh, if uh, a person wants the complete application to be in java or or some other language so this is yes this is, um, yes Yes, absolutely accurate. Yes, yes, yes. And for for Python specifically, yes, we we are targeting mainly NumPy and SciPy and the machine mm -hmm. learning libraries to be accessible. Um, the Python team we started Python like uh, only I think two years ago or something. So it's the youngest of our languages. So we still have some compatibility work to do, uh, but we can also run we can already run the basic SciPy and and and, and NumPy examples. Those already run. Uh, and uh, over the next year, we will talk actually a lot more exactly about that use case that you talk about, like Python machine learning plus other languages plus Java here. Uh, because we think really that that could open up a, a whole ecosystem uh, to the JVM here. And uh, yeah. yeah, as I mentioned, sure, you could always say, yes, why don't you do another web service, et cetera, right? I mean, um, there is, there is, benefits and drawbacks for splitting your application into very small parts. Uh, the, the downsides is that, yes, you have to manage two processes. You have to configure the heap for two processes. Uh, so you have like overheads, you have communication overheads as well. You have, you have uh, man manageability overheads from just the runtime data structures of these two VMs, uh, but you also have uh, communication overheads. And um, 
yes, you, with Scrabble, you basically have the choice. You can do both, right? We are not saying that you should always like put everything into one app, but with Scrabble, you don't need to make the choice whether you put it into an app or not. You can make the choice based on just what is more convenient to you, right? Or what is more fitting to your current architecture. Okay, yeah, that that makes sense. So, what is the uh, what is the architecture of Crawl VM looks like on a very high level? So, um, so Crawl VM has uh, this. Uh, the, the core of Crawl VM is really the Crawl VM compiler, uh, and mm -hmm. also this was how the project got really started. This is the core component that we developed early on. So, the Crawl VM compiler is written in uh, Java. Okay. Um, so now what we do, however, is that when we are creating the Gravium build, we are doing a head of time compilation of the Gravium compiler with the Gravium compiler itself. So when we do a release of Gravium, we have the Gravium compiler compile the Gravium compiler, right? Um, oh. And create and, and in this sense create a binary from this, which is a fully ahead of time compiled form of the Gravium compiler. Now this binary um, we link into the hotspot binary. Hotspot is written in C++. It's just compiled with the C++ compiler, and we then link it with the binary that's created from our Gravium compiler. Um, and then in this setup, like in the hotspot virtual machine, the just-in-time compiler is replaced with the Gravium compiler. But from hotspot perspective, it just looks like, oh, another native compiler is in here. It's just, you know, there's C1, there's C2, and now it's Graal as another compiler. So th this package of the hotspot compiler plus the pre-compiled Gravium compiler, this is the, the core of Gravium and provides the just-in-time capabilities. Uh, for all the languages. Um, so for Java, it's clear. For the Java language, the, it can run on, on just on hotspot and we just compile the bytecodes, right? So the other languages, they are written on top of the Truffle framework. The Truffle framework itself is also just written in Java. It's just a Java library for building interpreters. There's nothing special about it. It can run on any JVM as well. It will, any, any of our interpreters actually is just a Java program. And it, the interesting part is it's just a Java program interpreting the other language. Mm -hmm. Meaning it's a Java program interpreting JavaScript or it's a Java program interpreting Ruby or Python, right? So the, the interesting question now is like, you know, when this is just a Java program interesting, interpreting JavaScript to Python, why is it still relatively fast? Like this should be pretty slow, right? Because you just have an interpreter and you kind of have, yeah, your Java is a fast language, yes, but it's still only an interpreter for Python or an interpreter for Ruby. So how do we make it fast? And this is the, then the, this, uh, the, the, the biggest, I think, research contribution of GraalVM is this mechanism on how we make these interpreters still fast. I have here a, a research paper uh, that we were publishing here um, a couple of years ago. It, we, we called it one VM to rule them all. Uh, there's also a follow-up uh, paper with more of the results because this is more an ideas paper. Uh, but I think to understand the, the, uh, the mechanisms behind how we make these interpreters fast, this ideas paper is probably uh, the best. Um, and uh, so, the way we make it fast is by partial evaluation of the interpreters. So now, what is partial evaluation? Partial evaluation is, I mean, in some sense, it's nothing very fancy. Partial evaluation in general is just, I have a function that has multiple parameters and I make some of the parameters constant and then I evaluate the function on the assumption those parameters are constant. So if I have a function f equals f of x is x plus one, right? Then a partial evaluation of this function could be like f of three is four. Right? So I, I basically replace one of the inputs to the function with a constant, and then I do constant folding on the function because I do partial evaluation of the function until I can no longer further evaluate it. 
I mean, it is the example I gave the, the function goes to a complete constant, but often the function would kind of only partially go to constants, but some would still remain, right? So now we drop for we to partial evaluation of an interpreter, and we do a partial evaluation of the interpreter in a way where we are evaluating the interpreter, and the interpreter is an interpreter, if you think about an interpreter, interpreter is a, it's just a function with one parameter, which is the input program, and it's evaluating the input program. Right? And with the partial evaluation, we now uh, assume the input program being constant, and uh, with that constant input program, we are then specializing the interpreter for just this one function. So let's assume we have this JavaScript interpreter, and it's completely generic. It's, it's just executes JavaScript programs, and there's an execute method. And the execute method has one parameter, which is a JavaScript function. But now what we are doing is we are specializing this interpreter not to be generic anymore to, to execute any function, but to execute this one JavaScript function that I'm really interested in. And uh, by specializing this interpreter for this one JavaScript function, I get a new version of the interpreter, right? That can only execute this one function, but it is very fast in executing this one function because we fold everything, we fold in the compiler, we do all the constant folding in the compiler to have just one thing to execute this one function. And this is, this is a core principle how, how we are able to do an automatic compilation uh, from an interpreter method, uh, from an interpreter uh, to the compiled code. Because what we do is we, yes, we interpret the JavaScript program, then we see a certain JavaScript function is very commonly called, so it, it's becoming hot. And then we are specializing, we create a specialized version of the JavaScript interpreter for just this one function. And in the future, when this function is called, we just call to the specialized version. And this, this is the magic sauce behind uh, the, uh, the truffle and crawl VM approach uh, to have everything written in interpreters, but still like automatically compile from it. And this is the most important piece of the whole platform because this piece is the piece that makes sure that there is no, like, our compiler is completely language agnostic. Our compiler does not know anything about JavaScript. It does not know anything about Ruby or Python or whatever, right? So we can keep the core part of the compile and runtime system completely language agnostic. And only this one translation step from the interpreter, like, like the, 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 only, the, only, the only part that's really per language is the interpreters. So the, the way the language semantic is defined is only the interpreters. The, the past evaluation and the compilation is language agnostic. And this, this allows us this big reuse of all these components. And this allows us also to make our, our language specific parts really nice and beautiful to write. Because now if I want to uh, write my language to run on top of Gravian, I don't need to deal with the JIT compiler. I don't need to deal with assembly. I don't need to deal with any of this stuff. I just write an interpreter for my language and the Gravian compiler kind of takes care of the rest. And, and this is why for us specifically, the language teams have a very nice high level way to express the language semantics, um, which makes it easier to even experiment with new language features. So if somebody tells us, you know, we have JavaScript, but we really want to have a new feature in JavaScript, let's say operator overloading or something like that, uh, we are able to implement this very fast because we only need to modify the interpreters. We do not need to modify any other parts of our system. I only need to go into the JavaScript interpreter and there just add like a few methods to the interpreter and that's it. And the rest of the pipeline is completely language agnostic. And, and this is the biggest, um, this is also the biggest research contribution uh, of the Gravian project. So the, the core principle of uh, behind this is called the first Futamura projection, which was published by Futamura, which was a very uh, famous uh, like um, Japanese scientist. Um, he he was he was back then. He was it was somewhere in the seventies even. He was creating this uh, principle behind this partial evaluation of interpreter to compiler, 
And our contribution to this is that we, we took some of these core principles that he was uh, publishing back then, and we added some additional things on top of this to make it practically work and automatically work for nowadays languages like JavaScript, Python, etc. cetera. Uh, and, uh, and the one thing to make it practically work is um, the, uh, to combine this with the mechanisms of de-optimization, uh, which are the core mechanisms that were first deployed in the hot, original version of the hotspot uh, virtual machine. Uh, which are which is this mechanism to speculate on something and then go back to the original version if the speculation fails. Um, because the main challenge of of like executing these dynamic languages like JavaScript, Python, etc., is that you need to speculate on types and you need to speculate on the the way an operation would would work. Um, because the problem in the dynamic languages is that like a certain operation can have many different meanings. Mm -hmm. So an example for this is you have a JavaScript plus, and if you have the JavaScript plus, then it could mean almost anything. It could mean like I'm adding two numbers, I'm adding two doubles, I'm adding two strings, I'm adding two objects, right? Mm -hmm. All of this is valid. So when we see a plus in JavaScript, we don't know yet what it should be. And, um, and then what we need in order to efficiently compile it is we need to speculate on like, well, I saw a lot of numbers here previously. I think I will probably see numbers here again, and I will only compile the number case into the system. Uh, and and this is, this is but, but then like, this is a speculation. We cannot prove it that there's always a number there. So we gotta be uh, aware that like, yeah, you know, there's, we saw always a number, we think it's gonna be a number, but if it's not a number, we still need a kind of a bailout. We need to de-optimize, it's called, to, to go back to the other cases in case we still need them. And uh, and, and the Truffle framework is basically this, this partial relation of interpreters combined with this speculation on types. And this makes it like the ideal way, uh, we think at least, to implement dynamic languages uh in a in a very like uh, natural way uh, while still having it fast and and not having like a separate um run temple language because because the the reason for us why language interpolability is so easy is that we are compiling everything with the same compiler we are compiling everything with the same truffle framework so now at the compiler level the compiler doesn't doesn't know is this was a compiling javascript here was a compiling ruby here Right? So, so that was even enable us to inline across languages. So, so we could like have a JavaScript call out to Ruby and we compile those two things inlined into one method. Uh, and this is something no other system is capable of doing at the moment. But for us, because of this very language agnostic design of the system, it's like almost like yeah, it's natural. It's a natural flow from like the design of the system that we have this capability. Yeah, this sounds super interesting. Uh, I mean, all the things that uh, you have said in the past 10, 15 minutes is, is uh, super rad and super interesting. So uh, I think these clearly explain the uh, exact essence and the flavor that Graal VM brings uh, on the table uh, for for you know for the usage. So can we see? I mean, can we see this in action now? Can we see Graal VM in action? Some something. Uh, you want you want to do me a live demo right now? Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of not set up. I'm, I'm kind of not set up for that. But but I have I have some more uh, like um, uh, like 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 one thing I think I, I wanted to talk about and and, and like uh, to to get a little bit more practical of what you can do with Gravium, right? Um, yeah. It's it's uh, it's this uh, cheat versus ahead of time thing, right? So. So we're talking now a lot about uh, the chit compilation and the, the languages on top, et cetera, et cetera. So now um, a lot of people, when they look at Gravium, they will say, I want to use Gravium for native image. And uh, native image is a part of Gravium. It's important to say it's not all of Gravium, right? It's kind of like a, it's, a, it's, it's like a project that came out of it, a sub project that came out of it. Uh, and uh, we were actually like when we came out with native image, we were surprised by its success, right? For us, like 
for us, the big thing was Graviam and the languages and everything. And then we, we went out as our first release, and the users were like, oh, I want native image. Right? So, so this is also shows that when you go out with a project, I mean, you go here open source with a project, sometimes the users will be like smarter than you in terms of like seeing a potential somewhere where you yourself were like not even you know, looking, right? So, so here, this was an example. Native image was an example like that. We came out with GraalVM and suddenly a lot of hype on native image. And native image is a, is a very core component to, to the GraalVM project nowadays. Uh, it's important to still say it's not the only thing, right? So we really want people to say, because sometimes people then use synonym. They say like, you know, GraalVM and in reality, they only mean native image. So native image is a way to do ahead of time compilation for these languages because because the JIT compilation has certain disadvantages, right? So we're we actually coming a lot from a JIT compilation mindset with the optimization, de-optimization, profiling, all these things, right? And, um, and because, because as, as JIT compiler experts, we, of course, you know, think for a long time, you know, JIT compilation is, you know, the best, et cetera, et cetera. And it has certain advantages, JIT compilation. The main advantage of JIT compilation is that, yes, you can observe the problem behavior while it's starting and warming up, and therefore, you have the ability to make maybe better compilation decisions based on the program behavior. Now, JIT compilation also has big disadvantages. And uh, the first and maybe the, the most, the biggest disadvantage is the startup time. Because you, as you start the program, it needs to first compile and warm up. And it will run up to, like I think, 50x slower, typically, in the interpreter until it's JIT compiled. Uh, the second aspect of JIT compilation that's a problem sometimes, and this is this is underappreciated, is it's not very deterministic. So if you have a program written in Java or Python or JavaScript and you execute it multiple times, you could end up with different performance characteristics because the warm-up period was a little bit different, or the JIT compiler makes a little bit of a different decision. So you don't have a very good like uh, deterministic pass from like the program to the program's performance. Now, ahead of time compilation solves that. So at ahead of time compilation, you do the, the time is spent during build time and no longer when you start the application and you have a full deterministic uh, performance. The performance might be a little bit less uh, depending on, uh, on the ahead of time compilation quality, but uh, at least it's deterministic. And this can sometimes be more important um to be like uh, to knowing what your performance expectations are etc cetera, etc cetera. and you you will not have the the problem as well that the JIT compiler itself is competing with the application so if you want to use not many cores uh because you want to have uh, i don't know like 10 processes in your machine and not so many cores available then also ahead of time compilation can be a very good option and and Carbon has this out of time compilation mode where we, we 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 take Java and and other JVM based languages and we do full ahead of time compilation. We do this by creating a closed world assumption around it. So we we figure out everything that the application is using, and uh, in this way packaging it then into a binary such that the original bytecodes are no longer necessary. We do have certain limitations on this, and, and a lot of the limitations are also because of the history of the project. The history of the project was that we didn't intend initially for this head of time compilation feature to be very broadly applicable, because our main goal was to compile the Gravium compiler itself ahead of time. So we designed the feature originally just for internal use. We designed it for use of like, yeah, let's ahead of time compile our Gravium compiler. And we knew, okay, certain features we are not using in the Gravium compiler, so we're not supporting it. Only when then the community came and said, like, look, I want to use it for every application I like, then we were forced to like do a lot more work on compatibility of ahead of time compilation. And the team has made a lot of progress over the last year already, and we continue to focus very heavily on adding more and more uh, of the uh, being able to have more and more like programs uh, compile ahead of time here. Okay. So in this ahead of time uh, compilation, we are like this is this is the architecture of how this uh, this is running. But like we take the application, like uh, the libraries the application uses, the GDK the application uses, and then we do this. It's called the points to analysis. So it's like just the reachability analysis. It, it starts from the main program and expands the universe. 
Uh, we call it the Big Bang. Like if you search in our source code, there's a class called uh, Big Bang, and this is like where from the from the main of the of the app, you like you start to explore the the the, the space until you you have captured everything. And then after we captured everything, then we do an ahead of time compilation into binary, and that binary is then uh, giving you the fast startup and 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 the small footprint as well because. The footprint is smaller because uh, the just-in-time compiler and its metadata structures take quite some memory as well. And uh, in ahead-of-time compilation settings, you don't need any of that. So, so this this is the this is the core essence of this uh, ahead-of-time compilation uh, feature of 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 Coravian. So. In this head of time compilation feature at the moment, uh, it is the case that uh, you are uh, going slower. So I, I have this little diagram here where I'm showing the, the benefits and drawbacks. Where like uh, startup speed ahead of time compilation is better. Uh, memory footprint ahead of time compilation is better because, because you need less data structures. And the packaging size can be better sometimes. It's not always better depending, but, but it, like, the packaging size is, is, is smaller because you don't need a JVM um, available uh, for running your application. Your application is just your application, right? Um, now, in some scenarios, well, if you have a Docker image already based on a JVM, then there might be no advantage there for ahead of time compilation. But the startup speed and the memory footprint are main advantages. The, the predictability of performance is another one, uh, but it's more a, a qualitative advantage and, and, and hard to hard to quantify. Now, on peak throughput and on the maximum latency, uh, our cheat modes are currently better. We have, in the latest Gravium release, uh, fixed this for the max latency. Because in the latest Gravium release, we have also a new compiler, uh, a new garbage collector available for the head of time compile mode, which is based on the G1 garbage collector and therefore has a low latency. Uh, because the latency requirement is, is, is mainly for, for languages like Java, the latency is, is, is primarily uh, dependent on the garbage collector that you're using. Uh, because it's dependent on what's your, what's your longest garbage collection pauses. And the smaller the longest garbage collection pause, the better your latency. And on peak throughput, our JIT compilation mode is still a little bit better because it can, um, it can speculate. Uh, it can compile something with an optimistic assumption, and then it can later de-optimize and re-optimize. And this is something the end of time compile mode cannot do. Right? But what we added to the end of time compile mode to make it a little bit better, at least, is to have a profile guided optimization, also for the end of time compile mode, where you run your program on a certain test scenarios, and then afterwards you compile it with the profile from these test scenarios. And then also in ahead of time compile mode, we can start to reuse some profiles. But our goal here still is to remove the disadvantages of ahead of time compile mode, because we think in a cloud setting, like the ahead of time compile mode is probably like specifically in a microservice setting, it's it's better because if you have small programs, um, you can you can scale better. You have less problems in terms of uh, garbage collection, interconnections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas, like if you if you have everything in a in a huge JVM process, you have scaling problems. You have problems with the heap being kind of not separated. Uh, and uh, yes, you can mitigate that by using a very concurrent garbage collector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but like it's not it's not the the ideal scenario typically. Uh, where we think that it's better in a microservice setup to build all the microservices uh, into ahead of time compiled images and then have them small, concise, scaling, and um, yeah, and, and have here with Java. And in, ultimately, here Java can have even an advantage over, let's say, JavaScript and Python in terms of the footprint. Because JavaScript and Python starts very fast, yes, but it's still only chitted or interpreted. So it's not ahead of time compiled. So this is why here with, with Gravium native image, uh, because Java is typically has historically a little bit of a, of a, yeah, you know, Java applications are big and heavyweight and, 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 and yeah, I mean, even, even the core Java JIT has, has improved a lot in last versions, but uh, with this uh, Gravium native image now, 
uh, you can have Java suddenly super lean and fast. And you can have your Java app start in like eight milliseconds, 10 milliseconds. Like it's, 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 it's really a game changer. And, and it's, it's something where people, that people would not be aware that Java is also able to do this. But with the Chrome native image, uh, that's, that's now, um, that's not possible. So Graal VM native images are much more faster, even with the uh, with the newer releases that you said that Java has, which has more improvements in the GIT. Uh, so how many? So right now, ahead of time compilation is only for for Java, and it is expanded to other languages. I mean, uh, as you are saying that there's work going on uh, at least for expansion to the other languages. Uh, so I think that would be. Uh, really interesting to see because uh, if we have the ahead of time compilation and we are able to connect uh, the best of all the languages uh, without having separate microservices, uh, then probably this would be a really interesting and and very uh, uh, very precise use case that people can go for uh, without even writing separate separate microservices for each separate uh, module. You can have uh, not a very big app, but still you can have a small app with certain set of modules getting used and uh, uh, the Graal VM images uh, that are that are fast and uh, ahead of time uh, compilation is there. So it will be like low memory footprint, faster uh, in runtime. So all these things and even the, the communication between the microservices would not be there. So that overhead would also get reduced. And like you said, like uh, the heap uh, is will not be a problem anymore. So all these things would definitely uh, make a lot of sense. Uh, so there is a, a interesting blog that I posted in, in the chat uh, for everyone, which is uh, uh, Graal VM 10 things. I think uh, it, it gets updated. Uh, it, it's it, since 2018, uh, the blog is there, uh, but uh, it gives you a com gives you a high level overview of uh, like how it is high performance, uh, it's right now uh, on Graal VM 19.3.0, and but we have I think uh, 21 is already released. So probably you can uh, you can just try out the flow with the latest Graal VM. Obviously, you will be having more features, uh, but try out the same flow uh, with the newer version, newer release, uh, which has more features. And uh, now the now the there is only one layer, uh, like uh, Thomas. Uh, uh, said uh, it's the truffle layer itself for all the languages, uh, which was previously previously not there for Java, but now it is there for Java as well. Uh, so all that things you can explore. And also, I found one interesting thing, uh, which is this. I'll just paste that as well. Uh, let me just do all destinations. So this, these are I don't know. I haven't tried this out, but uh, these are some of the uh, Katakura scenarios. Uh, so this is a course on on uh, on Graal VM, like set, setting it up, uh, the JIT compiler, uh, native image, uh, which uh, explains the ahead of time compilation, and then uh, multi language, uh, which is again I think it it is it might be built on the same ten things uh, that you are doing, and they have been in the form of Kata Kata scenario. So if you want don't want to uh, do that on the on your machine, you can probably try it on on uh, Kata Kata. So which, which is completely fine. Uh, but I think uh, trying it out with your uh, own hands would make uh, you know make all the conversation that we had till now uh, more sense. So whatever whatever Thomas has said about ahead of time compilation, when you you will see it in action, it will make more sense. And then also the the multi language thing because it's it's not possible like right with other languages you you can't do that uh, if you have to use a python module you have to write the python code if you have to use uh, uh, natively uh, some uh, some framework then you have to use their code but this provides you a, a special way uh, in form of context am i right Yes, yes. OK, so in form of context, uh, you will be able to uh, use or call other libraries uh, and other frameworks in other written in other languages, which are supported by GraalVM, of course. Uh, and there is more work going on. I mean, uh, I'm not saying that everything would work out of the box. Uh, so there's more, more work uh, going on, like especially on the machine learning prospect of uh, Python uh, to have uh, most of their pieces working when you're writing Java code uh, so that you can do uh, you can, you know, uh, use the best of both. Uh, so that I think these are some of the cases when when 
uh, it actually makes sense uh, to use Kral VM and uh, and yes obviously the speed is there it's faster uh, so that 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 always was the top uh, priority when when uh, even since the initial days and it's scary forwarding uh, to all the releases so i have uh, i mean um, um, i was just looking at uh, thomas one of the issues which uh, which is open for a very long time now um, which is golang support um, i wanted to just bring this topic um, over here like go is there go is fast uh, go is you know uh, taking has taken over the cloud native ecosystem uh, i mean most of the cncf landscape projects are written in go so how does uh, uh, i don't know whether it's right to com to say that how does crawl vm compete with go uh, but i just want to know your thoughts on like uh, like go is there crawl vm is there what are your thoughts on that mm -hmm. yes yeah so so we i mean crawl itself doesn't compete with Go. I think I think was, you could argue that one aspect of GraalVM allows Java to compete better with Go. Uh, because uh, because one uh, one uh, at least one reason to use Go maybe for some projects is the fast startup and uh, maybe lower memory footprint. But with GraalVM native image you get uh, the same or maybe sometimes even better numbers even for Java, right? So so it's it's like I think I think for people that are Java programmers that would go to Go uh, for the footprint of startup, like uh, the good news for Graviem is like you don't have to. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's different tastes of languages. Some like you know others better, etc. You can and I'm not saying anything negative about Go, and some like it and some don't. But at least at least we and and this is a core principle for us as Graviem developers. We don't want you to choose a language just because the runtime gives it different characteristics. We want to give you, for your language, the best characteristics. And we with GraalVM give you, if you're a Java programmer, you want a fast startup, you don't need to learn a new language, go to Go. You can keep Java and the Java ecosystem at your heart and have the same footprint and startup characteristics as Go. Right? So that, that's an area where I think we would, GraalVM is not competing with Go, but GraalVM helps us think JVM based languages compete with Go. Now, uh, the we always always wanted to also execute Go code. It's it's uh, it's something we absolutely want to do. The biggest obstacle for us was that Go is like in terms of language ecosystem, kind of the from the static languages, the odd one out in terms of like there is no at least up until recently no good LLVM backend for Go because the Go team has like uh, yeah has like has always been of more of like, yes, we do everything ourselves. We don't even go to LLVM bitcode. There is, and, and, and that makes it harder for us because for us, LLVM bitcode is like an input format we already support. So if Go would be able to compile to LLVM bitcode, uh, we could execute Go, right? So at the moment, the best bet we have, and there's also, I think there's some project to compile Go to WebAssembly. I don't know how far they are along. But uh, for us, the best bet to execute Go is in a way where like when Go supports LLVM page code or WebAssembly as a backend. And I think one of the two will come true very soon. Uh, if that's not the case, then it's difficult for us because we would have to invest like a lot into supporting Go as a, as a language. Uh, and, um, and that would be, I think, I think um, I mean, we, we would certainly support any efforts and we would also support working together with the Go team on anything related to that, uh, but uh, we ourselves alone would not be able to 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 do, do such an effort. Um, but but I think I think Go will soon have better support for WebAssembly and and LLVM bitcode, and then you can you can run it uh, in, in better ways. And there already are some projects that do it, so we can already claim to be able to run Go. <laughs> It's just not the most, you know, uh, tested or, you know, and, and if you if you use some more complex things, it won't work, right? But the Go Hello World kind of runs already. Right? Uh, and um, yeah, we certainly want to have Go in the ecosystem because I think one of the biggest uh, disadvantages of Go that I heard, at least some developers say, is that the module, the module system of Go or the modules available for Go is actually not that rich. So so as a Go programmer, it depends on the area you are in, but but but. Um, you know, for machine learning or something, I don't think you would, you know, you would find a lot of sophisticated modules for Go, right? And if Go executes on GraalVM, then suddenly uh, we bring the same benefits to Go, meaning like we can also then with Go uh, reach out to the to the Python uh, machine learning library. 
Yes, definitely. And I think WebAssembly is picking up a lot of pace uh, in, in the past recent uh, year or so. And there have been a lot of uh, developments. So I have pasted a uh, few links uh, that gives you a uh, overview of how Go is doing uh, in, in the Web, WebAssembly space. And there is some there is something, uh, some link from the issue itself, which is on CrawlVM, uh, which points to Go LLVM. Uh, I don't know what that is and uh, whether that is something related that would be uh, helpful yes. for, for the compatibility. Yes. Or yes, yes, there is the Go LLVM project, which compiles Go to LLVM bitcode. And if you can use that project, then you can run that LLVM bitcode on Grabian. Yes. Um, oh. yes. As, as for WebAssembly, uh, we are supporting WebAssembly currently as an input. One of the other things in the project that you're working heavily on, and I think that could be also a little bit of a game changer, is to support WebAssembly slash JavaScript as a target for native image. So you could then run uh, the results of your native image in, in a browser environment. So ideally, of course, WebAssembly would be good for us as a target. The biggest problems we have, and that's why we couldn't do it yet, is that WebAssembly has no support for any kinds of garbage collection. And it doesn't have support for one feature we would need. Because you could say, OK, that doesn't matter, because the native image itself has a garbage collector in there, right? Uh, but uh, we cannot compile that garbage collector into WebAssembly because there's one feature the garbage collector needs, which is uh, stack walking. So I need to be able to walk my stack to find the references uh, for my garbage collector. And WebAssembly does not support that. And uh, to work around that would be too, too complex and too costly in terms of performance. But there are some WebAssembly uh, proposals to maybe, um, maybe add some stack walking support or add some garbage collection support. And those would then make WebAssembly as a target platform for native image. And also then for maybe the problem interpreters even, right, uh, would make it uh, better. OK. So I think uh, uh, so we we are close to like the ending. And we have discussed uh, most of the things that were there on the agenda. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, Thomas, for joining. And uh, uh, all the links that I've posted, especially the two, uh, the 10 things that you can do with, with Graal VM. Uh, do try that out uh, and definitely uh, try Graal VM, see its performance of the Graal native images and uh, the ahead of time compilation. Uh, see, uh, I mean, try to do a practical scenario of that using uh, the latest version and the blog, uh, which gives the detailed information like how you can use a sample code and run the benchmarking and run multiple. Uh, languages uh, and the truffle framework so all these things are really interesting so go try it out and definitely contribute i think uh Graal vm already has 14 14 000 plus stars so which shows that the community loves uh the Graal vm and uh, uh they they want more out of it so probably it's it's the very right time uh that you go and uh, try to contribute as much as you can to Graal vm and be a part of this emerging growing community uh, with that, just I would like to end with uh, uh, the recent uh, a book that I wrote on the CK scenarios. Uh, so this is a book for Kubernetes uh, uh, certification uh, security one. So you can, uh, uh, it's, it's available on Gumroad. Uh, so I'll paste the link in the chat. And there are two packs, one is the book and one is the gold one, which has the video solutions. Uh, and uh, thank you all for ho those who have already purchased that. Uh, it has got a very good response. And also subscribe to uh, the stream or uh, the YouTube channel um, uh, so that you do not miss any stream uh, like these ones where we have technical deep dives uh, of, of the product uh, of like what are the building blocks, what are the main ingredients and how, how the things are working, uh, what are the base algorithms that makes it faster and you know from the origins till the um, till the language support and the, the growth and everything. So uh, don't miss out on these things because these things uh, inspires me, and I think there are millions out there who uh, who know. You know is the right time uh, to to uh, contribute to such great projects like Grand VM, and uh, uh, definitely it has great future and a great scope for your contributions. And obviously, there is active development from the Grand VM team. 
So thank you, Thomas, for joining us. Uh, anything you would like to address to the community? Final words? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Sam, for having me here. It was an interesting conversation. Thank, thank you for, for organizing all of this. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, we, are, we are like an active community. Uh, we have a very active advisory board with many companies there. We, are, we have a lot of um, people uh, giving us comments on GitHub and Twitter. And I really encourage you, if you're interested in the Gravium ecosystem, yeah, reach out to us. Uh, can also reach out to me um, on, on Twitter if you have some suggestions or on, on, on our GitHub pages. So yeah, this is, this is an ecosystem and it's big and it's growing. And uh, we want the community to participate in the ecosystem and uh, it's it's really something where we we take additional value from to have people use our technology and integrate it into their into their system and bring their own ideas and that's really great stuff so yeah but uh, yeah th thank you Sayam, for this uh, for this conversation no thank you so much for for coming on the stream and you know educating us about graal vm its main features ingredients and and just about everything so just stay on for a minute and I'll just end the broadcast for the others. Uh, thank you all. Have a nice day. Bye. Take care.